A very good evening to one and all. I'm Avneet, an artist and uh, a minor host for this evening. It is my pleasure to introduce Samrat Chaudhary, also known as Samrat X. Samrat is an author and journalist. His first novel, The Urban Jungle, was published in 2011. He co-edited Insider Outsider, an anthology delving deep into the complex issue, identity issue in Northeast India. Some co-founder and member of the editorial board of Partition Studies Quarterly, a new online journal focused on the forgotten causes and consequences of the partition of India in its northeast. Today, Samrat will speak about his latest publication, The Braided River, a travelogue following the Brahmaputra, and the many hot button issues of identity, ecology, military, and political issues churning in the northeast. Following the conversation, he will take questions from all of us. I thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. I hand it over to Samrat. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Avneet. I don't know how many of those issues I'll talk about because uh, uh, I sort of have a, a more informal uh, chat planned rather than a real talk. And, uh, you know, so I'm just planning to uh, have a conversation and of course I'm happy to take whatever questions people have at the end. And uh, so basically <clears throat> this is a journey that uh, my friend Akshay Mahajan who happens to be a photographer and I, we undertook along the course of the Brahmaputra river uh, in the world uh, long time ago, uh, the ancient world of uh, 4 BC, four years before the coronavirus when uh, it was possible for people to uh, basically get on a plane and go off somewhere without having to get themselves, you know, poked by foreign objects. And uh, so, so we uh, did this journey to to sort of uh, trace the course of the uh, <clears throat> Brahmaputra for as much of its length as as we could. Uh, the river itself starts in the, uh, to, towards the western side of Tibet, uh, not far from Mount Kailash. And uh, that part, the, the part in Tibet on into the border of India, uh, we were not able to do eventually. Uh, I'll just try and show you, uh, just for reference, the uh, a, a, a rough uh, sort of sketch of what, what the trajectory or what, what the route of the river is so that you have an idea. And uh, so can you see the screen? Yes, we can. See. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a very sort of rough schematic of the rivers. This here is, is the Tibetan part of it, which is called the Sangpo, and uh, it it flows uh, eastwards, west to east, and then it does a very remarkable turn for a river, a sharp, almost U-turn at what is called the Great Bend. And uh, this place is now a matter of contemporary interest because the Chinese are planning to build the world's biggest dam over here, uh, world's uh, largest hydropower dam in terms of generation capacity over here. Uh, it will be bigger than the Three Gorges Dam and they've cleared it. So it's probably going to happen. Uh, so over here, it turns around and then it uh, flows into over here. This is the border and then it's flowing into Arunachal Pradesh. All this is Arunachal Pradesh. It comes down from the hills and at the foothills, that's Assam. And that is actually where the river takes the name of Brahmaputra because this part of it is Sampo. Over here, the part in Arunachal is called Siang. And over here, it meets at the foothills of Arunachal, where it reaches Assam, it meets the Dibang and the Lohit. And these three together become the Brahmaputra. And then as the Brahmaputra, it flows through the whole of Assam, the Brahmaputra Valley, which has the name of the river. And at the end again, that's another international boundary. It flows into Bangladesh. And as soon as it crosses the boundary into Bangladesh, 
the so-called male Brahmaputra, son of Brahma, becomes the female Jamuna. So the river undergoes a name change and sex change at the international border. And as the female Jamuna, it flows into, uh, into Bangladesh towards an eventual confluence with the Ganga. Very few people in India sort of have this notion that the Ganga and the Brahmaputra meet, but they do. Because the Ganga, when it enters Bangladesh, also changes its name. And uh, so one, tri one tributary, one distributary is the Hooghly, which flows past Calcutta. Another distributary is the Pad Padda, which is actually the main channel. And uh, that meets the Brahmaputra as Jamuna. And then those two together flow towards the Bay of Bengal. They meet other rivers along the way, but eventually it flows into the Bay of Bengal. So that's the rough uh, sort of uh, trajectory of the river. And uh, the part of it that we followed was the part from the China border, the Tibet Arunachal border, down to the confluence with the Ganga. Uh, there is this you know, issue of, of uh, which part of it is, is the real Brahmaputra? Is it all the Brahmaputra or is a certain part of it the Brahmaputra? It's an issue of nomenclature. And it's also an issue of definitions because uh, we have certain concepts or ideas about what a river is. But uh, until I actually went uh, into sort of trying to write a book about following a river, I never thought really about these things. I was a layman, uh, you know, a journalist. I was not really uh, uh, sort of clued in on what, what a river is. So I had, I guess, the layman's notion of a river, which was that it's a channel of water with a bank here and a bank there, and that's it. And uh, it's only when Akshay and I landed in Dibrugar, and on our first day there, we sort of said, let's go and look at the river. So we went to have a look at the river. And uh, you know, then we started to realize that something was wrong, because here we were, and on the map it had said Brahmaputra, and here we were on the bank of the Brahmaputra. But when we asked people, you know, they said, no, this is not the main channel of the river. This is not the Brahmaputra. So, so we were a bit confused. And uh, I'd like to read a little bit about that, uh, you know, that, that initial, that introduction to the river, as it were, so, so that uh, this, this uh, element of fluidity, in a certain sense, uh, you know, uh, which is, in my opinion, the essence of the river. Uh, and, and the process of its formation uh, becomes a little clearer. So this chapter is called, Who Moved My River? We had not thought that the Brahmaputra would be hard to find. It's huge, it's a river, and it's right there. I had seen it many times in Guwahati, where it is a single channel of water flowing between two banks, and the opposite bank is visible. And of course, I had seen it neatly marked on maps. After our first day in Gibrugar, I realized something was amiss. It was there all right, but it wasn't a neat, muscular channel of water flowing between two clear banks. It was this thing that had major and minor channels, all of shifting and varied names and identities. I figured that one of these, the most major of the major channels, was the actual Brahmaputra. It would have to be tracked down. So, taking the advice of the friendly smuggler, we decided to go to Dibru Saikwa to find the river. So our first river guide was a friendly smuggler. He is a timber smuggler in somewhere near Dibrugar. Our drive took us to Guijan Ghat near Tinsukia, <clears throat> where we found room on board a large wooden houseboat. It was evening and the sun was setting. The river raced past us, all walls and eddies. We could hear it and see the odd tree branch or uprooted water hyacinth bobbing downriver at pace. Sometimes there would be a little splash in the near distance as a chunk of earth fell into the river. It was a sound that would become familiar. It was the sound of the water eating away the land. I wondered whether we had found the real Brahmaputra. Is this the main channel of the Brahmaputra? I asked Madhav, the Ahom boy who was our porter, guide and general handyman on the boat. I got the response I was getting used to. No, this is the Dibru. The Brahmaputra is and he waved his hand in front to point to the expanse in front of us. There. 
There across the Dibru River was a large sandbank that turned out to be a river island. Night fell. It was a night of deep darkness, darkness of a kind that you can never see in cities. The silence was broken by the sound of distant folk music from somewhere across the water. We had seen no land around us apart from the river island. There was no light visible. However, the island was clearly inhabited, and the inhabitants in this distant outpost in Upper Assam seemed to be Bengali. The song was in an eastern dialect of Bangla. The sky was more lit than the earth, the pinpoints of countless sparks, stars sparkling above us. It was like nothing like the sky that's visible in the city. We might as well have been on another planet. Here on the river, I turned my gaze up and sat looking transfixed. A band of light was clearly visible. The Milky Way, I said to Akshay. I had not seen it before. Hathi Pathi, said Madhav. Hathi Pathi, elephant path in the sky. There's a quote attributed to various people from the Buddha to Anais Nin that goes something like, we do not see things as they are. We see them as we are. So basically, uh, you know, we started to see things in a different way also. We started to see things with, with new eyes ourselves as we went along, uh, following the course of the river. And uh, we spent our night on the houseboat there. And uh, we experienced a different sense of time for one, one thing, because we had gone in from Bombay. And in Bombay, of course, it's the city that never sleeps. And then here we were on a boat in the middle of a river. And uh, it was very quiet and very dark. And uh, the sense of, uh, of, of time and space both were altered. And uh, I still remember that Akshay and I sat there on the deck of the boat thinking maybe it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and we tried guessing the time. And of course, we failed miserably at guessing the time. Because when we finally checked, what we thought was 10 o'clock was actually 6 o'clock. Uh, so by 7.30, we were done with dinner and ready to sleep. The night passed with little incident and in reasonable comfort, except for a brief period around 3 in the morning when the power failed. The fans stopped whirring. It was sweltering hot. I threw off the covers and was immediately set upon by hordes of mosquitoes. The only other sound was that of water lapping against the hull of the boat. There was nothing to see. It was pitch dark. Someone was walking about in the narrow passageway outside my cabin. The power came back after a while. I went back to sleep. We were up at first light around 5 a.m. without any alarm or wake up call. The time zone in Northeast India is certainly different. Morning started early with cups of chai and biscuits and the only perennial activity here, river gazing. Then a man in combat fatigues carrying an AK-47 walked in. The boat staff seemed to barely notice his presence. I looked around to see if there were more. Soon enough, there were four the boat. They walked around, avoided conversation and soon left. There were soldiers from the Indian Army's Kumaon Regiment out on patrol. No one on the boat seemed to have anything to say about their little visit. It, it's one of those things, you know, when you're traveling in Northeast India, somebody suddenly comes in with guns and walks around and walks off and it's like whatever, nobody has any reaction to it. So <clears throat> we started on our water journey into the Dibru Saikwa National Park soon after. Our transport for this leg of the journey was a small wooden country boat fitted with a very loud motor. These are locally known as bhutbhuti for the sound they make. The crew included a small wiry boatman and his underage apprentice, a boy of 13, whose job it was to constantly bail water out of the leaky boat with a plastic bucket improvised from a used cooking oil can. Boatman Radha Binod Pal was from Sivsagar, also in Upper Assam. He had moved to Guijan Ghat in 2005. Dibru Saikwa had been declared a national park in 1999 and the first tourist lodge in the area run by a reformed poacher named Joynal Abedin had come up. The United Liberation Front of Assam's insurgency, which had severely affected these areas, was winding down. Tourism was starting and there was work for him. The river we were on, the Dibru had been a smaller river then. Pal said. It started growing. More water coursed through it. Year on year, it kept becoming more powerful. 
so we went on this river for a while and you know we followed we followed the course of the river because we were actually looking for the real brahmaputra even then and uh, so i describe a little bit about the journey the channel we were on which varied between 70 to 100 meters wide flowed strong stumps of big trees stood almost concealed in the water at intervals they had succumbed to its flow Boatman Pal stood at the prow of the boat, peering ahead for signs of submerged danger. His apprentice Amit steered, following his hand signals. The speed with which he waved his hand seemed to be an indication of the urgency with which the boat needed to be turned. On one or two occasions, he also turned and glared at Amit. He probably had a few close shaves. The heat increased, the hours wore on. We stopped taking photos, conversation ceased. We began wiping sweat and drinking water in silence. Three hours later, we had still not reached the real Brahmaputra. The river we were on had widened. The forest had thinned. Now it was sandbars on one ha hand and grassland on the other. We were getting close, Pal said. We came upon it quite suddenly. It was like nothing I had ever seen or imagined. In every direction before us, as far as the eye could see, there were only channels of water separated by sandbars and river islands. It was a water world. This vast entirety of sand and water was the great Brahmaputra. Here at the edge of the Dibru Saikwa National Park is close to where it is in truth born. This is where the rivers Siang, Lohit and Dibang merge. In the area around the river island, roughly 35 kilometers long and 10 kilometers wide, on which the park is located. The untidy tassels of water it together form is the Brahmaputra. To think only the main channel is the river is folly. In fact, the whole combination of channels and sandbanks constitutes the river. The Dibru too is a part of it. So is the river channel we had been on on our first day out in Dibrugar. The river is the sum of its parts and it is much more. It has come to be that the Siang, which is the longest and strongest of the three formative tributaries, is seen as the Brahmaputra. But the part is not the whole. In terms of water volume, the Siang is at best about a third the size of the Brahmaputra. The Lohit, which meets the Siang on the northern shore, shore of Dibru Saikwa, is no minnow, and the Dibang in monsoon carries a surprisingly large volume of water, more than the Lohit. So, this is all. It's 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 stuff which is of great importance in practical terms uh, now because uh, it is an issue between India and China, and. Uh, uh, basically, people don't think about, uh, you know, about how those borders came to be drawn and how uh, those political boundaries came up. And uh, for that matter, about, uh, you know, what there's always a lot of stuff in the newspapers about dams being built by China and uh, plans by India to build dams as well. Uh, I don't think that uh, there's enough detail ever mentioned about how much water actually comes from the Tibetan side of the border. And that is a very uh, important point because actually most of the water is from our side of the border. It's not from the other side of the border. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, so the Brahmaputra, I say, is not, it's, it's not the Siam, which is how it's drawn, even in the map I showed. It's a simple straight line. But of course, it's not like that. It's it's lots of tributaries going into each of those rivers which form the Brahmaputra. It's more like a nervous system. It's more like a uh, you know, like arteries and veins, small arteries becoming bigger arteries, and finally you get the Brahmaputra. And uh, hydrologists call it a braided river which is what the title of the book is, The Braided River. The term starts to make sense when you see the Brahmaputra not from a bank, but from somewhere in the middle. Braids of water run into one another. Sometimes the channel seems to flow in a direction opposite to the channel next to it. The dance of creation and destruction is visible in the play between sand and water. The fine silvery white river sand accumulates over time to form sandbars which turn into little islands. There's lots of islands. Then some subtle balance in the forces at work may shift from one side to another. The water may start to nibble away at the island. 
it is possible that the island may disappear or it may not. Perhaps a bit of grass will start to grow on one of the countless sandy islands. Perhaps the tall cash grass will take root. Sand may slowly start to turn into soil. A seed may float in from somewhere and grow into a tree. One tree may turn into many trees. Animals and humans may come to visit and settle. Then one monsoon day, the river may rise and lay waste to it all. It may start eating away the island until no more than a sliver of sandbar remains. And the cycle of creation and destruction starts again. So what I realized in the course of this journey, uh, one of the things I realized was that uh, the living river, change and fluidity are the very essence of, of the living river. And uh, it is the exact opposite of a canal, which is static, fixed, straight lines. This is the exact opposite. This is fluid. It's dynamic. It changes size. It changes, uh, uh, you know, direction because one channel, which is small today, may become bigger over a period of time. The main course may shift. Uh, so it was only, I suppose, through this journey that that a, a statement that many of us have heard over the you know, decades or years without really thinking about it. The statement that one can never step into the same river twice. And I had to uh, pretty much, uh, you know, write a whole book on the river to understand what it really means. Uh, because now I understand that, that you can't step into a same river twice. It's changing all the time. And uh, the even it's not just the, the natural geography, which is always in a state of constant shift, uh, seasonal shift, annual shift, but also longer term changes. Uh, it's also the, the human geography, which also people tend to think of as fixed. It's the political boundaries, which people tend to think of as fixed. And even those are always shifting. You just have to expand your span of time a little bit and you see how it keeps shifting. Uh, and a very good uh, reference point to this is the man who uh, is usually credited with saying that you can never step into the same river twice, an ancient Greek philosopher named Heraclitus and uh, a pre-Socratic philosopher. Now he was Greek, so you'd imagine he's from Greek from Greece, but uh, apparently he was from Ephesus, but Ephesus is in Turkey now, but uh, as is Troy, uh, of Helen of Troy fame. But, uh, you know, so those were all parts of ancient Greece. But the thing is, they were not part of Turkey either, because at that time, they were part of the Persian Empire. Ephesus in, in uh, Heraclitus's time was part of the Persian Empire. Similarly, on the Indian subcontinent, similarly in the part of the world I'm talking about. Now we have these very fixed notions about, you know, what community should live in which place, where the political boundaries lie. But can we forget that these political boundaries and these maps are very recent? I mean, you didn't have the Mercator projection before Gerardus Mer Mercator invented it in Europe in 1569 or something. So basically, uh, our way of seeing the world is something which we have invented. And uh, this invention has come to us through the British colonial period. Uh, the first maps were actually river maps of that part of the world. And uh, the first map of India uh, of note that uh, people still remember is James Major James Reynolds map. Uh, it was a map of Bengal to begin with. and. Uh, it was in the 1780s, if I recall correctly. And uh, so he traveled up the Brahmaputra. And uh, he was the first to map that part of the world. Our current contemporary notions, no matter how you want to trace it, either of, uh, of uh, geography or of political boundary or of concepts of ethnicity, religion, and identity. 
are all essentially they can be traced back to the colonial period uh, you can't really trace them back beyond that and uh, not in the same way and uh, so this this was also something that uh, uh, i suppose uh, became clearer as i traveled along the course of the river because i also had to engage with history and uh, not in any i'm not a historian also so i engage with it as a traveler and uh, uh we went to for example on the course of the river just short distance from the river is sipsagar the old ahom capital so all around sipsagar and so i had to engage a little bit with the history of uh, the ahom kingdom and then uh, following the river further down the course uh, in lower assam uh, we had to sort of uh, you know we came across we were traveling when uh, the that that final part of it we were traveling when the nrc process had already started and uh, so that issue cropped up in conversation and uh, then finally the last bit of it in bangladesh uh, i got to see it from the other side of the fence as it were and uh, to you know to meet and interact with people who live along the river or on the river and uh, uh, very interestingly uh, people have been moving up and down but uh, not in the way we think uh, for example i stayed in the house of a man uh, a hindu man uh, because this is has to be said since since this is the you know the uh, issue nowadays about migration and uh, uh, his his uh, grandfather had moved down river there a fishing community and uh, his grandfather had just moved down river and uh, from dhubri which is in assam to chirajganj which is in bangladesh and uh, this was before partition so at that time there were no borders over there so he just took his boat and went down the river and he liked it there so he stayed there so this man's uh, the man whose house i stayed in his father was born in what is now bangladesh but at that time it was not bangladesh and uh, uh, it was still undivided india and then they stayed on after partition when it became east pakistan and uh, uh, they stayed on till 1971 when the genocide started and uh, by the pa west pakistan army and civil war essentially and then they fled they took their boat because again being river people they could take a boat and go up the river so they took a boat and went up the river and came back to dhubri which is where they had gone from in the first place and then after bangladesh became free after the war ended and the war was a very short war it was a two week war and uh, after the war ended and bangladesh became a free country they went back there and so this man uh, he's been there all his life uh, he is a hindu bangladeshi and uh, uh, so i mean so it was so interesting to sort of see all these you know all these uh, all these uh, issues and all these uh, uh, sort of very charged political debates from a different angle and uh, i had gone into it with all i had gone i mean i didn't know for example how the border between china and india came to be drawn up but the whole of arunachal is claimed as chinese territory by china and uh, so i had the usual notion that the chinese are being evil and they are trying to grab our lands and all of that but it's a lot more complicated than that and similarly at the other end also and so so the process of engaging with all of this which happened as a as a part of the journey uh it uh, it it sort of uh, it was uh, uh interesting and uh, i guess uh i guess that uh, oh i forgot i i forgot completely about the map which was there so anyway uh so i don't know i mean uh, i'm happy to take questions and uh, uh, you know fire away and if i can i will answer them if i can't i'll say i don't know <laughs>
Yeah. Oh, I have something to show you. Wait, wait. I have a few pictures to show. Give me a moment. So, so we traveled all the way down, and there there are a few pictures that uh, that I have to show. Because. Is it working? So that's the that that's the. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can. Yeah. Hear you. So so that's the that's some of the pictures. I can actually maybe since I didn't explain the pictures, maybe I should go back and at least explain some of them. Let's see. So for example, this one. This is in Majuli, and uh, it's an interesting photo because. That person who looks like a girl is actually not a girl. That's a boy, and uh, it's in one of the satras. Uh, it was basically they were having a, a dance performance. This is this is in Kamakya Temple, Ooh. and uh, this this is in. Uh, in Bangladesh, this is the Jomuna Bridge. This this is a uh, river island in Bangladesh, which uh, this man was uh, he had sort of its its new land which has been born out of the river, and this man was uh, planting peanuts there. So basically, land. Is born of the river, and people claim it and start using it. And uh, sometimes there are disputes over it, but uh, they they do grow stuff on it. They grow crops on it. This uh, this. That was too short. Wait, let me try. Can you see the crocodile? Yeah, there's a croc, croc, croc right there. That's in the Sundarbans, and uh, you can see a line, a, a sort of a line above which everything is green. So that's of course the tide mark. So, yeah. So it was quite an interesting trip from from the edge of Tibet. Down to Bangladesh, and I did go to Sundarbans also. Um, journey of a lifetime. Now that one goes from one's bedroom to one's living room, and that's about it. And uh, yeah, so thank you very much, and uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Samrat. It was really interesting and beautiful photographs as well. Uh, so I think now we'll keep the session open for questions.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Guru. Hey, hey, yeah. Samrat. Uh, that was fantastic journey. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed. Uh, I also worked in Western Ghat rivers, four rivers, but it was a complete different journey. Uh, it was more about looking at landscape, biodiversity, mapping kind of stuff. But this is fantastic okay. narrative. Uh, I just yeah. had one uh, quick thought. Uh, when you are reading through the chapter, it was very nice to understand certain sounds that you are able to capture. Uh, I, I really felt the need of uh, uh, the layer of sound uh, in when when we visualize this kind of stuff. Like otherwise, it becomes more of a uh, storytelling. But you have brought in some of the nuances of those sounds into it. It was amazing. But uh, just a quick question, kind of uh, because uh, Assam gets flooded during the monsoon and. we hear lot of its story like kaziranga gets flooded the rhinos mm-hmm. get uh, killed kind of stuff so were you able to see this dynamics in the river any part in time and were you able to uh, capture the sound of the change that ever happened it, it's a it's a question like you, you might have done it but i just wanted to understand okay. yeah. um well so as far as the you know the sound of the river is concerned uh, i think i mentioned in passing in that reading also the the memorable sound of the river is of the river eating away the land you can hear it uh, you probably know you you traveled along rivers um, but when it comes to kaziranga and the rhinos and the flood uh, it becomes a completely different dynamic because basically what you know what what gets projected in the press is that the floods are a terrible thing and uh, you know the rhinos are dying and oh, oh how bad but uh, of course it's not like that because basically the kaziranga is a wetland most of it is a wetland and uh, the rhinos would not survive as a species if it was not wetland and for the for it to remain wetland the floods are essential so so basically the survival of the rhino as a species depends on those floods and uh, even the 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 fish in the river now a lot of fish species can't uh, uh, sort of spawn if uh, in the fast flowing river so what happens is during the floods they flow into the wetlands which are connected to the river and then they spawn and then the baby fish becomes a, a little bit bigger and able to swim out and then when the waters are receding they swim out so it's a it's a it's a it's an intricate connection of nature and uh, when people you know they, they just say that oh floods boss the problem is that those are not places where people are supposed to live and the flood itself is not a problem for the rhino it's not a problem for the elephant they can walk if there's a flood the rhino and the elephant will walk away from the water because the water normally doesn't rise very suddenly it rises gradually so the problems we have are man made problems the rhino and the elephant is not able to get away from from the flood because there's a road right there there's a national high state highway so basically because of that highway the animals are not safely able to get out of the uh, you know the places which get flooded otherwise just after kaziranga across that highway as soon as you cross the highway on the other side of the highway there are hills the karbi hills so normally what would happen is as soon as the water start rising the animals will come out from there and go up the hill but now if they go up the hill then you know you have poaching and so on and so forth so basically what kaziranga a uh, national park staff have to do is make sure that the animals don't get poached when the flood waters are rising that's their big problem so it's not really a, a problem of nature it's a, it's to a large extent a man made problem thank you thank you <laughs> um samrat i have a question uh, what did the brahmaputra this mighty beautiful river what what did you what did it teach you what lessons did you what did what did take away from from this travel and the river was i mentioned one or two in passing uh, the lesson of fluidity the lesson of change because i think we've got used to ways of thinking which are very uh, sort of very uh, 
hardwired, very, very sort of, you know, uh, rigid. And uh, the lesson of life being fluid, the lesson that, that the uh, aspect which marks out the living from the dead is change. It is the difference, as I said, between a canal and a river. If the river was not changing, if it became the Sabarmati, it would be dead. When you make it a straight line, which does not vary, you basically turned it into a canal and killed it. It is the, it is the very unpredictable change of the river which makes it a living entity. It is an organic living entity because it is subject to change over time and change over space. If it can't change, then it's dead. Very beautifully put. <laughs> Thank you. Questions are from Yes, Katrina wants to speak. Yeah, please, Katrina, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask, could you give some examples? You said the human geographies are shifting as well as they live alongside the river. Could you also, um, after the things you have now said who, who, that were so put so beautifully, could you maybe give us some examples of the how the humans live who live cross, close to the river? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, it's basically... Uh, it's a it's become a very political debate in india nowadays uh, related to the issue of migration and uh, there's a lot of debate now about uh, migration from bangladesh into india and it is a very sharp and and uh, uh, polarizing political debate now the human geography in terms of these populations which live along the river in the part of Assam, which is called Lower Assam, which is the, which is the downstream part of the Brahmaputra uh, close to the border with Bangladesh. Actually, those people and those lands, those lands were never cultivated lands. So the human geography there, basically the, the human settlements there, uh, what started to happen in the colonial period is that the British wanted, once they uh, had control of Assam, uh, which happened, it, it's a process. It started in 1826 with the uh, war between the British and the Burmese. And it's very interesting how that started. A lot of the same things are happening right now as we speak. So the, the war between the British and the Burmese had started. Uh, the first place there was a problem was Arakan, where the Rohingya are from. And uh, then gradually, uh, the Burmese got involved in, in the politics of Assam. The Ahom Kingdom crumbled and the Burmese captured it. And then the British got drawn into the conflict because by then they were already uh, ruling from Calcutta, where I'm sitting right now. And that was the capital of their uh, growing empire. And uh, they brought drawn into the conflict and uh, you know they fought the Burmese, defeated the Burmese and so both Northeast India and Burma became part of the British Empire. Uh, after the Burmese, the British had taken over Assam, they, it was a, it was the East India Company, it was not, uh, it, it, it was uh, an empire run by a company and so naturally it was run for profit. Uh, and uh, so in order to increase revenue and profit, they wanted to increase the productivity of the lands along the river. And they wanted to start uh, to increase the cultivation of rice and uh, of jute. So three, they started tea plantations, Assam tea, which became a huge thing. And uh, they increased the cultivation of rice and jute. For, in, for the cultivation of tea, tea plantations, they had to import labor and they imported labor from central India, tri 
tribal populations from central India. For growing jute and rice, it required a different skill set. And they encouraged the migration of people from what is now Bangladesh, from Moimunshing district to be specific. And uh, for a brief period, Assam and East Bengal was one province. In 1905, uh, ben Bengal was partitioned. When Bengal was part, and that was the process which led to the partition of India in 1947, uh, because it was done on the basis of religion, Hindu and Muslim. Uh, but Assam was sort of tagged on with, uh, with uh, East Bengal. So it became one province. And that is when most of the migration happened. It happened and after 1905, between 1905 to 1947 is when most of the migration of uh, Muslim peasants from what is now Bangladesh into Assam happened. But, uh, and that is when those lands came to be, you know, occupied and cultivated. So the human geography, natural geography was related and they were related by uh, commercial interests. Uh, so it changed and uh, it, it remains a very polarizing, as I said, political issue today, even now. Because people think that the migration has continued or that it has happened recently. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Questions? Uh, um, Samrath, I also have a question on similar line. Actually, I'm told actually that uh, whenever the river uh, reaches uh, Bangladesh border, uh, there are a lot of villages shift their places. You know, actually, that river, the moon, by the flow of the river, mm -hmm. the villages are shifted between India and Bangladesh. Sometimes the village will become <laughs> suddenly part of India. Sometimes it will become Bangladesh. Is it true, or is it a? Is there any story around it? I have not come across, maybe it could happen because uh, I think the notion of border that most people have, frankly, is, is uh, you know, I don't know how people picture, what is the picture of a border? Uh, I think the idea of a border for many people might be drawn from, you know, Sunny Deol movies or from the Waga border, but uh, it's not really like that, especially in the case of the India-Bangladesh border, or for that matter, the India-Myanmar border. Uh, those are very different from the India-Pakistan border. Uh, the India-China border also is actually, but because it's the Himalayas and because it's very remote or in Ladakh, it's very remote territory, it's different. But uh, the, the uh, India-Bangladesh border is a very notional border. It's possible to walk across it without knowing that you have walked across it because in many places it's rivers which dry in the dry season. So basically, you know, on the map, you'll see that it's marked. On the ground, there's nothing. And it happened to me by mistake. I walked into Bangladesh and uh, just asked some fishermen, you know, there, there was a narrow channel of water left. So I asked those people, where's the border? And they said, it's behind you. So I had to rush back because I was afraid that now the border security force is going to arrest me saying I'm a Bangladeshi trying to sneak in. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's very interesting. That's very interesting. <laughs> I wish actually, I wonder whether rivers can teach us, you know, how to live beyond borders <laughs> or a borderless humanity. <laughs> That's so wonderful. You were taken as a spy, I think, no? once you were, I think you, in, you mentioned it. Uh, that happened at the other end. That's the China border. Oh, okay, okay. Not, I mean, I wasn't taken as a spy, but basically they treated us with great suspicion because uh, we, we sort of uh, went there and hardly anybody goes there. And uh, we went there, we had the permits to be there, the inner line permit, which you required. But they didn't really recognize those permits. And uh, they said, what is this? And, you know, who are you? And uh, uh, <laughs> so they didn't 
they they looked at all our documents and uh, you know they basically still weren't convinced and then they we had we had got there on the back of a dumper truck i suppose if we had gotten there in a nice suv they would have treated us with more uh, respect but uh, because we reached there on the back of a dumper truck so they immediately surrounded us and treated us with great suspicion and uh, you know didn't believe my id cards which said i was the editor of a paper in bombay what was the editor of a paper doing on the back of a dumper truck and uh, so so they put us back into a into the back of the dumper truck and sent us right huh? back no Avnit, ah, Avnit. Thank you so much for all this. But I have a question. So uh, you mentioned that pe people, you know, have migrated from various regions. And migration still, I think. Mm -hmm. And I have an aunt in um, Bangalore whose grandparents lived in Bangladesh way after the partition, and now their house is turned into a, a state building. i have a question my question would be that uh, what the people who are still migrating or they live on the banks or so what do they identify as as and and because the problem is uh, growing about this identity and nationality and so what are what is their uh, take on all this and how, what is their plan for nrc and how are they going to you know okay well uh, so basically most of the people uh, you know the, there's only one state in india where the nrc has happened already which is assam it has not happened anywhere else and uh, when it happened even though it was very difficult for people they all participated all communities willingly participated because everybody wanted this suspicion to be clarified because there has been this uh, this long enduring suspicion and uh, what ends up happening is that every bengali whether hindu or muslim is viewed with suspicion in that part of the world as being bangladeshi so people especially from these communities like bengali hindu bengali muslim both wanted the suspicion to be over so people participated willingly everybody wanted the nrc the assamese wanted it because you know they thought that uh, there was a lot of illegal migration and uh, they wanted it it's been a part of the politics for a long time it led to the assam agitation and the assam accord and they thought that the assam accord has not been duly honored and uh, implemented and uh, so they felt cheated they thought that there's been a lot of illegal migration and these people need to be thrown out and uh, the uh, a lot of people from other communities especially bengalis felt that uh, you know that they are legitimate citizens but they are eyed with suspicion and they wanted the suspicion thing so everybody wanted the nrc to be done properly but once the exercise started people realized that this is a very difficult maybe impossible exercise to do properly accurately i'll give you examples why <clears throat> you have to do it it's a bureaucratic exercise it has to be done by the state government officials and uh, first of all we know how the government works in any state in india right uh, so that's one part of the problem and uh, then the second thing is how do you do it so you do it through documentation so the government specifies that you have to have this this or this document and uh, you know then on the basis of that it will be determined but the documents you are talking about have to be from before 1971 they have to prove your citizens your you know either you or your ancestors were there in assam as citizens before 1971 now it is 2020 it's 50 years ago already 50 years is a long time if i ask anybody to produce a document from 50 years ago it's a problem uh there were i mean it's there there were other sort of methods as it were because you could become a, uh, you know included automatically in the nrc if uh, your ancestors name was in one nrc which was done in 1951 but it was not done in the whole of assam 
there were parts where the that exercise was not done so anyway there was a lot of complications and then you talk about documents so you know birth certificate but until one generation ago in the villages of india people would be born at home nobody would be born in a hospital so they didn't have birth certificates you talk about education how what percentage of the population of india completes class 10 or class 12 that they'll have board exam certificates so everybody is not educated you know you can forget about things like passport and all that's like only the elite except one section which goes abroad for for as as migrant workers otherwise only the elite have passports average indian doesn't have a passport so so you start looking at the documents and slowly you start seeing that there's a problem the only document that everybody you know may have is voter id right even there if somebody's got a spelling mistake they're out because they'll say you're not that person or married women who have changed their names there's a problem so all kinds of problems kept cropping up and eventually what happened and then there were also all sorts of mistakes so eventually when the results were declared then everybody rejected it when the nrc was finally after so much effort so much money uh, you know it it took i forget how many years but four or five years and you know 50000 people from the assam government and some 1400 or 500 crores i don't remember the figures but a lot of money a lot of effort and uh, at the end of it uh, the uh, all assam students union rejected it the bjp rejected it they were the ones who had wanted it in the first place they rejected it and uh, now there's a sort of uh, an effort to cancel the whole thing and redo the whole thing the second time i don't know how doing it two times or three times or five times will change anything because you still have those problems so at the end of it it's going to basically end end up uh, driving a lot of poor people into further misery fighting legal cases for which they don't have money and nothing is going to happen not one person will be sent across the india bangladesh border not one thank you i have one more last actually anybody else any questions I has any questions I have one question, uh, uh, Samrat. Actually, mm -hmm. while since you travel across the things, is there a common cultural thread you can find among? Although you mentioned about it, as a promise, actually, as a promise for India, you know, actually, the future. <laughs> can we say the river? Uh, we often call about river cultures in India. Is there any common thread that connects the, uh, you know? Uh, all 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 kinds of people irrespective of their religion or language or boundaries the, is there a common thread a few thread you can you find in your journey i mean i my my sense about it is people are people that's it i know it's a uh, uh, after all there is fluidity as i said uh, you know i i realized more strongly through following the river there is fluidity of all kinds of identities and uh, including cultural identities including ethnic identities and uh, you know so we think of linguistic identity for example as being somehow written in stone but that's not the case and uh, i suppose right now if i say rajnikanth is tamil nobody is going to say that he is not but of course his origins lie in what is now maharashtra so we could say he is marathi but he is not marathi he is tamil and uh, so linguistic identities also change ethnic identities change the the identity you know the division between between uh, tribal and non tribal changes uh, i even racial there are people of portuguese descent in 
the Borak Valley of Assam because the, there were Portuguese uh, soldiers of fortune who participated in the wars between the Mughals and the Ahoms and their descendants are there. So there are all kinds of people who have gone all over the place and become part of you know some other place and acquired some other identity. So I think for me the the uh, you know the the thing that connects us is is our its imagination. We have, we, have, we are linked by you know by imagined communities as Benedict Anderson said, and uh, we can imagine these communities in so many different ways. Uh, whatever the imagination is, as long as it's a wholesome and inclusive imagination, no problem. Thank you. Which answers it. Guru, uh, Narendra, I have one last. Hey, Guru, want to ask? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, taking forward Narendra's uh, uh, point of view, I, I just felt that uh, in Siddhartha, when he sits on the river and he gets the final kind of enlightenment for himself and he says, this is what life is. So was there any such moment for you <laughs> when you were traveling across and said, wow, this is what it is. I, I and you wish, become Siddhartha I mean, at the end of the day. I, 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 I must watch Siddhartha again. And I wish that there was a, you know, a, a, a moment of uh, epiphany like that, like that. But uh, uh, I don't think I've, I don't think I had a moment, a particular moment of epiphany, but it was a lot of beautiful experiences. It was a lot of lot, wow. lot of all kinds of experiences. And I would recommend for everybody that if and when the coronavirus situation gets better, you know, uh, it's worth traveling in that part of the world before it changes beyond recognition. And uh, uh, I suppose it it will be an adventure in itself at the very least. Arithrin, if you can, I yeah, you yeah. want to ask, yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, please. Two things. Uh, one is that uh, Koshi uh, uh, between Nepal and Bihar uh, is a very boisterous and rebellious river, and the colonial uh, um, dispensation has tried to sort of uh, tame it and very unsuccessfully. I mean, it has always defied any kind of attempt to tame. So um, I, I just thought that I'll uh, remind everybody about the similar experiences elsewhere. Uh, may not have much political um, <clears throat> significance, but uh, but definitely in ecological uh, significance. And the Koshi has always changed courses and uh, many times. And, um, and in spite of all the embankments that the colonial government and subsequently have done, uh, that's one. Neg second. I think of Sujitra Vijayan's uh, Midnight's uh, Borders, which also got published this year, uh, along with yours. So um, it's interesting that these two books are sitting knee, knee to knee, so to say, <laughs> um, in both uh, dealing with similar issues. But uh, your, your presentation was brilliant, and I, I would certainly like to grab a copy of the book and read it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, the book is available in the Amazon. Yes, available, yeah. <laughs> in the Amazon, yeah. I, I saw it. Yeah. Okay, thank you, you know, so much. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to ask that, but that's why I put it as a uh, message. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Samrat. It is a wonderful, uh, <laughs> wonderful to uh, listen to your and talk. I'm sure that we move books on the Brahmaputra or in, any books you're currently working on. Uh, I have something in mind and okay. uh, I've started doing some work on it, but right now this has just come. So it will, I guess, be a while before I get anywhere with the next one. Thank you. It's brilliant. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.